So the first seminar is going to be um, Shito Prajapati, In Action Together, Public Art in Process. Shito Prajapati is the Interim Managing Director at Common Field and works as an arts advisor through her agency, Lohar Project. Focusing on public engagement, special projects, and organizational planning, she serves on faculty at the School of Visual Arts in MFA Fine Arts Program and is the board chair of Art and Feminism. Shito received an MA in Arts Administration and Policy from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA from Northwestern University in History and Gender Studies. She told us the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Claudia. And um, thank you to Coda Lab for inviting me to be part of tonight's program. It's um, really exciting to be presenting alongside such great speakers. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to jump right into it because we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, producing public art projects. And um, over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity um, to work on a few major projects. And um, this session is really going to focus on some of the things that I've learned from them, some of the insights that I kind of picked up along the way, and some of the things I would recommend to any of you who are thinking about um, developing public art projects. Um, so the first thing is to just go over what I see as some of the key elements of any of organizing any kind of public art. One of the things I talk about a lot is how public art is always an exchange. It's an exchange between the people that are organizing it, but once you put art into any kind of space that's deemed public, that exchange is an ongoing process um, from the inception of the work all the way to beyond its existence in that space. And um, there are a few really important things to remember when you start thinking about how to really put an exchange-based experience together in public space. Even if the work, in this case, what you're seeing on the screen is um, Hank Willis Thomas's um, Unity sculpture, it is a static piece of artwork, but everything that's happening around it is always part of the conversation of the work itself. So the first thing, and maybe one of the most important things is a team. Um, whether you're the artist, whether you're an organization looking for an artist, whether you're part of, whether you're part of a community, all of those constituents need to work together. And that includes your funders, having faith in the work that you're doing, um, and artists really being able to work freely and openly with the people that are supporting their work, whether that's an organization or a fiscal sponsor or something like that. And the other element of it is the public and the community, the space that this work is going to be actualized in, the people that are going to be seeing it every day. Um, those are all really important aspects of um, not necessarily conceiving of the project itself, but also part of the way it's presented, no matter what it is. Um, resources, making sure that you have what you need to get this off the ground. Unlike making work um, in your studio space or for a gallery space that's very discreet, um, public art has a whole set of specific challenges and opportunities, and that requires a different set of resources. So really thinking through making sure you have everything you need. And when I say resources, I also am speaking about the people that are working on the project with you, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, another component that I found to be really a key is research, understanding of where and who you will be working with, but also who will be encountering the work itself. And I think this is something that everybody on the team should be engaged in. Um, whether you're working with people that have lived in the spaces that you're going to be presenting work in for a long time, or you're working with um, the organization that's putting it together, um, everybody needs to have a shared understanding of where the place that they are putting this work and they are putting this message. Um, and that leads directly to intention. I think these two things are very, very tied together. Why make work in public space? For what, for whom, and to what end? I think, you know, when we talk about seeing artwork, again, in more traditional spaces like a gallery um, or a museum, you know, those spaces are created and constructed 
to highlight the work and kind of isolate it from everything else, right? So you can really focus on the object or, or whatever it is that you're experiencing. But when we talk about artworks in public space, we're talking about a whole set of relationships that will immediately emerge once this work is in a space. And so understanding the why of what you're doing and, and your desired outcomes is really important. Um, permanence or residue. Um, I mentioned before, even when work is temporary in public space, it always leaves behind a residue. It leaves behind something with the people that encounter it, the space that it was in, and thinking about the implications of that through the process of putting together a public art project. And finally, and probably most important in some ways is flexibility, recognizing that when you start thinking about putting work into public space, anything can happen, things that you expect to happen, and sometimes and often things you don't expect to happen. So today I'm gonna kind of go through these major elements that I just outlined through talking about three models of public art projects that I have been part of over the last um, 20 years of my career. Um, I'm gonna talk about a project called Stotenema, which was a project that I was part of in 2020 as an executive producer. Um, it was an artist-led project with fiscal sponsorship. Um, and it was a, locate, is a, a project that engaged with location-based organizational partners and um, also had a volunteer-run component of the experience. It was a participatory work um, by its nature, it involved inviting the public in to help actually build this monument, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And some of the major themes around the work were healing and genocide. Um, I also, in 2019, worked on another public art project called Rumors of War. It was a sculptural work by Kahinde Wiley, and that was installed and debuted in Times Square in New York City. And that work was a major public artwork. We had cross-institutional support from the gallery, from Times Square, um, and the work itself uh, was kind of organized um, by these institutions, and I was part of the project team as the engagement specialist. The work itself was a sculpture, and some of the major themes in that were politics and race. And finally, I'm going to talk about a project that I did many years ago when I was in graduate school called the Chicago Ravioli Project, and that was a student-driven artist collaboration. A set of students, including myself, working with an artist collective. We had no major funding, and the work itself was um, uh, identified by the artist as guerrilla art. And one of the major themes of the work was art as a gift. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with talking a little bit about Stotenema. So Stotenema was, is a participatory public monument that is commemorating, the, commemorating and remembering the 1995 genocide in Srebrenica in um, Bosnia-Herzegovina. And the artist uh, that conceived of this project, Aida Stehovic, she uh, has been um, installing this monument in different cities around the world um, for 15 years. And um, part of that work is related to her own personal narrative, but a big part of the impetus for this project in and of itself was around healing and remembrance and um, thinking about this work as a way, uh, as part of a larger effort to resist genocide, violence, not only in this area of the world, but globally, recognizing that genocide is a global problem and is not specific to one region of the world. And in that effort, um, up uh, until 2020, um, Aida, each year, would bring together a team of people, would do kind of grassroots fundraising and work with organizations in different cities. This monument has been installed in Zurich, in Chicago, in Venice, um, and in a number of other places over the last 15 years. And as she was moving into uh, the 2020 iteration of this project, um, it became really clear to her that this was an important year for the project. It was the 15th year of the monument, um, and it was the um, 20th, uh, the, the 25th anniversary of the genocide itself. And the project itself, as I mentioned, is participatory. And so um, 
Aida has been collecting these small coffee cups that are very common in Bosnian homes um, over the last 15 years. And she's been working with a group of women who were survivors of that genocide. The genocide itself um, took the lives of 8,000, over 8,000 men and boys. And so these women that Aida has been working with are the survivors of those victims. And over the course of 15 years, she's collaborated with them in a number of ways. Um, but one of the things, one of the um, really amazing things is over these 15 years, they have continued to contribute to the project, both in community building and in helping gathering these cups with the larger Bosnian community around the world. Um, and the 2020 iteration um, was the first time, and as I will talk about, the last time that uh, this monument um, will be staged in the way that it has been staged for 15 years. And it included um, enough cups to represent every victim um, of the genocide itself. And here's just a, an image of uh, part of the actual process of the monument where people are um, standing around, each, people, each person gets a cup and they fill their cup and put it on the ground. And over time, the monument grows. Some of the major components of this project um, changed and shifted because it was in 2020. So why in 2020? As I mentioned, there were two major anniversaries around the work and around the genocide itself. Um, but over the course of organizing this project in 2020, um, two larger changes occurred um, that really defined uh, uh, the way the work unfolded over the year. And one was that um, Aida was invited by uh, the folks at the Memorial Center in Srebrenica to present this monument for this anniversary. And in accepting that invitation, Aida realized that because these cups were going to land back on the, in the same space of this atrocity and the same space that these victims were being memorialized, that she had to leave them there. And so what was going to be an anniversary iteration of this project had also turned into over time the last iteration of this project in this particular fashion. Um, the project team um, that Aida brought together was very intentional for this. And the reason she did that is because for the 2020 iteration, she wanted to expand the work beyond just the nomadic monument. Um, there were two exhibitions planned, a feature length documentary film, um, looking at all 15 years of the work uh, of this uh, project. And over the course of the year, as you guys met, and as you can imagine, two of the exhibitions uh, that were planned got put on hold immediately because of COVID. And so in light of that, we then shifted gears and um, the team developed a series of three public programs in virtual space to start talking about some of these ideas. The exhibitions in some ways were supposed to kind of help develop this conversation before the monument itself was installed in July, but because we weren't able to do that, we had to shift gears. The other big change in the project was the location. So originally this monument in 2020 was going to be presented in Sarajevo. And because of our transition with the partners, we had already um, started talking and working with the location change to the Memorial Center in Srebrenica. And these, these changes really forced us as a team to rethink not only the way we were working and what was gonna come out of the project, but also how we were working because everything moved to online space and we weren't all gonna be able to travel to Bosnia anymore. Um, some of the basic structures of the project that are important for you all to think about as you're um, considering putting your own projects together is fundraising and resources. This project had fiscal sponsorship from NIFA, which means we could fundraise and they would be the stewards of the money that we brought in. And that was a really helpful structure for us because we weren't in a place to become our own nonprofit and really didn't need to at that point. Um, it's also important to note that the labor around the 2020 iteration of the project was a combination of paid work and volunteer work. As I mentioned, this monument each year is kind of stewarded by a group of volunteers who are trained by AIDA prior to the installation itself. But this year, in addition to that, AIDA put together a larger administrative and organizational team who were all paid during the course of the year. And finally, um, thinking about this project as an artist-driven project. This is a project that the artist has been working on for many, many years on her own and with different people over time. And so 
really for the those of us who came into the project for 2020, we understood this as an artist-led initiative. And finally, this was a project that was international and multilingual. So there were a lot of considerations around language with the website and the way that our interpreted materials were translated that were really important to accessing all of the audiences that we had the intention of reaching. Um, and here are just some a quick picture of the team itself. Um, our project team that worked together for a year or more included a finance director, a regional coordinator that was based in Europe, um, an executive a pro a producer for our film and um, a curator, and an executive producer that was my role for partnerships and film. Um, we also had four major partners for the course of this, which was Pinch Media, who is the documentary film company that has been following our, the process over the last year and will be producing the documentary film for um, Stotanema. Um, and then three partners in Bosnia itself, the Post-Conflict Research Center, um, the Memorial Center, and as I mentioned, the Women of Srebrenica. And finally, with fiscal sponsorship, it opened the project up to some major funding. And as a team, really led by Ida, we were able to receive major funding from the Rockefeller Brothers, Open Society Foundation, and individual donors over the course of the project. But one of the one of the biggest kind of lessons that I learned from this project is the importance of flexibility as things change. COVID was obviously an exception to that, but even our partners changed over the course of the project. And that really changed the shape of both what was possible and what was not possible. And I think those are really important things to remember as you start working with people, things can change. And I feel like this team, um, it was really special to work with them because they were all able to express and work with the agility needed to still realize the project and the iteration that we were able to in 2020. Um, the next project that I want to talk about is Kehinde Wiley's Rumors of War. So here's an image of it that you see on your screen. Rumors of War was a, a large scale bronze sculpture and it was Kehinde Wiley's direct response to the Confederate sculptures that um, he encountered in Richmond, Virginia in 2016. He was there for the opening of his solo exhibition of paintings at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And when he encountered these monuments to Confederate soldiers and Confederate generals, he immediately felt like he needed to respond to it in some way. And so what you see here is his response. And his response, this, in, this particular monument, was fashioned directly after a monument that is installed or was installed in Richmond, Virginia, um, uh, of General Jeb Stewart, who was a general in the Confederate Army. And so if you look up that sculpture and you look at this, you will see they're almost identical, except for two very important things. One, the title of the piece, Rumors of War, is on the plinth itself. And two, the figure on the horse is not the general, but it is a young African-American man in street streetwear. So when Times Square um, decided to bring this sculpture into Times Square, um, there was a conversation started about how do we engage our public with this? This is such a monumental work in terms of scale, but also a work that's really addressing the moment that we're in as a country. So really feeling like how do we engage people in these conversations or really like activate this work that has so many narratives embedded right inside of it. And when you look at it, if you take a little time to start examining it and you realize you're seeing something that looks familiar, but isn't really familiar, you know, it really opens the door for people to start talking. And the challenge of Times Square is, in terms of engagement was is quite high. Millions of people walk through Times Square every year, thousands and thousands a day. And many of them are tourists, which means some of them don't speak English at all, or certainly don't speak English as their first language. So when I came on board to work with the team there, one of the first questions we asked ourselves is, well, what would it take for people to stop and have a conversation about this work? And Times Square is not a place you necessarily expect to encounter artwork. It might be there, but it's not necessarily the reason you might go to that destination. Um, and so we kind of recognized all these challenges um, in the midst of a really big opportunity. And so when I came on board, we started talking about um, what 
what kind of resources we need. And we realized right off the bat that the resource that we needed was people. And so through those conversations, we developed what was the pilot, a pilot program for Times Square called the Public Art Ambassador Program. And um, we brought together a team of people from the Times Square's Public Safety Department. So all of the staff that um, keeps Times Square safe 24 hours a day in a station on the plaza, um, a member of their sanitation department, which is also a department that keeps Times Square clean for everybody. And then a group of, a group of artists, educators, and um, other young people interested in the arts. And so together, this team was trained um, to engage in conversation with people in the plaza. We also developed a response ball right in the plaza, recognizing that some people may not be as interested in speaking, but might have a lot of feelings about this work. And so, um, as you'll see in the slide that comes up, we created a response wall where people could both contribute by responding to the question that was on the wall that day, or simply read other people's responses that were already posted. Um, we also piloted public tours for Times Square around this piece in particular. Some of the things that um, I like to point out around this project was thinking about art outside of the discipline of art in this particular public space. So we realized there were multiple avenues to access a conversation about this piece. We could talk about American history. We could talk about race. We could talk about monuments at large, which is a big conversation in this country and also something people who live in other countries encounter and think about. And so we, we really, the research that I did around kind of preparing our public art ambassadors to talk about this was really giving them a set of tools where they could enter a conversation or introduce a conversation with someone in a wide range of ways. And the other, one of the other things we learned really quickly and developed as a tool for our ambassadors was a, um, an iPad device that um, provided a visual narrative of Kehinde Wiley's previous work, images of the, the monument that this sculpture was fashioned after, and some information about Richmond, Virginia, because the sculpture then found its home at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. So this narrative was really important that the inspiration for this work started in Richmond and the work itself was now going to live in Richmond at the end, at the end of its time in New York. Um, you know, this project was a large scale sculptural project. The public engagement aspect of it came later in the development of the project and was not centered by the artist, but actually by a team of engagement um, and ed engagement staff and educators and the Times Square arts team. And so um, in that way, um, I think a lot about this project because we, when we often think of public art and engagement, we think about the participatory works like Aida's work that I talked about or Paul Ramirez Jonas's Key to the City that took place in Times Square, where there is an invitation of the public to actually physically engage with the work itself or help contribute to the work in a, in a very tangible way. But with Wiley's sculpture, what was really interesting is that the work itself engage the public on one level just by the scale of it, the location of it, and really the monumental feeling when you're standing underneath it, you couldn't help but notice it. And it felt really exciting to really take that instinctive behavior and translate that into an engaged learning experience with people from all parts of the world, right in the middle of Times Square. Following, um, Following its installation in Times Square, I was able, also able to travel to Richmond and um, translated some of the training that I did um, for their docents at the museum, um, who were talking about the artwork in a completely different context, in the context of an art museum, in the context of Richmond, Virginia, in the context of the South. Um, and so it was really interesting to then have a conversation with them and really um, realize that this public artwork, the object itself never changes. But as it moved from one space to, the, to another, the engagement around it, the conversations around it grew and developed around the community that was there and looking at it and speaking about it. 
Um, here's an image of one of our ambassadors talking to um, a couple of people and really employing the iPad as a way to kind of move them through a story around the artist itself and kind of the significance of this work, not just for New York, but also for Richmond. And here just a, uh, I like this image a lot and I like to share it a lot because I think it really illustrates what we were contending with. There's this huge, I believe that's Kylie Jenner um, ad kind of on the side here. And, you know, if you've spent time in Times Square, anytime you're there, it feels overwhelming. It's, it's a really magnificent space, whether or not you like that aesthetic. And so even thinking about how to compete with the visuals that were surrounding the sculpture at all times was a really interesting way to think about public art. And I will say over time, the ambassadors and even myself started to see all these lights and reflection on the sculpture as an asset to the work, because we could easily tell people come here at different times of the day and this piece will actually look a little different, which was absolutely true. Um, here's a picture of the response wall. It wasn't very high tech at all. We kept it very, very simple, but you can see here, we had a lot of engagement and the questions that we decided to put on the wall were questions that ha were a, kind of a bridge between the artwork itself and larger issues that we in the United States have been talking about. And one of those is monuments and their place in society and their place in public space. And so you can see here, we got a lot of engagement when we really opened up the dialogue um, and, and thought about the artwork as an instigator for considering larger ideas, as opposed to the focal point of every discussion that could be had about it. And here's an, a picture of a woman in really like engaging with the with the wall in in this really beautiful way of kind of taking these notes home with her. And finally, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about a project I did in 2014 called the Chicago Ravioli Project. And as you can see here, this is a picture of four raviolis on a bench. And I, I apologize for the picture quality. These pictures are from 2003 and 2004. And uh, this is the best quality I could get them on these slides. Um, so when I was in graduate school at the School of the Art Institute, one of our um, classes, required classes, was called Collaborative Project. And I was in an MA program for Arts Administration. And in this class, we had an advisor and we had to pick an external partner to do a short-term project with over the course of the semester. And the intention of this curriculum and this class was to get us as young arts administrators out into the world and really get hands-on experience with organizing. Most of the groups worked with you know, a library or a small organization, did something um, around research or possibly organizing something in a discrete space. But the group of the four of us students that got together for this project were familiar with an, um, with an arts collective called Temporary Services. And they're a group of three people and they were working in Chicago. And this was really towards, I would say the beginning of their collective practice. Um, they had been working together for some years. Um, and uh, one of the projects that we had been familiar with was a project called the Ravioli Project. And it was a project where they would go into different cities work with a few artists, they would make small reproducible objects of art and then seal them in clear LP sleeves as you see in this image here. And they would seal them in a way that made them look like a ravioli. And so each of these clear packets was filled with art. And um, in these various cities, they would then distribute these packets of art in public space and leave it at that. And part of the idea was a, a guerrilla, you know, framing this as a guerrilla public art project, you know, intervening art into public spaces or, or kind of introducing art into public spaces in these radical ways. But another part of the project was also about thinking about art as a gift. And so when we decided to embark on our collaborative project, we decided we wanted to work with them and we asked them if they would be open to expanding the scope of this project in Chicago, because they had done a small iteration of it in the city before. They were very open to it. So in working with us together, we were able to bring together 30 artists who contributed to these packets that you see in the image. And we were able to construct and deploy 400 packets of free art across Chicago. And you know, during the time that I was working on this project, I don't think I fully realized the impact of what we were doing. Um, this project was probably one of the most low-fi, low-budget projects I have ever worked on in my career, but in some ways, one of the most exciting. 
Um, we did not, all of the artists who we invited to contribute, contributed their work to us for free. We were students. Um, we handled all of the fabrication of these 400 packets and the deployment of them, as well as collecting all of the artists' contributions. Um, we decided that in every, we wanted to or, organize some kind of public event, but we didn't know how to invite people that found packets. So we finally decided we would just invite them in each of these packets. So each of these raviolis included an invitation to an event on a specific day at a specific time at a bar. And uh, surprisingly, we had like 65 people show up for it. There was also a writing component to this project because we were students and we had to deliver a writing product um, to get our passing grade at the School of the Art Institute. And finally, this project happened in 2004. 2004 was three years after the 9-11 tragedy. And because of that, there was a lot of hesitation and uh, concern on the part of the school about us putting unmarked packets of art in public space. And that might scare people, that may, may, might make people uncomfortable. And I will talk about how we resolve that shortly. Um, some of the structure of this project to keep in mind, um, this was a student artist collaboration. It was school sponsored in the sense that the school supported us in doing it. They gave us about $500 to do our project. And it was very, very locally focused. We actually local, uh, focused on a few key neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, this was our project team. And um, as this is an example of some of the objects that were in the actual raviolis themselves. And then this was uh, something that we had to come up with last minute. So the school was very concerned, I said, about us putting packets, unmarked packets of ran what looked like random objects in public space. So we came up with a compromise, which was to create this set of signs that we, we put one of these in every single ravioli that we distributed. So as a welcome, as an invitation to take to pick these up and take them and not automatically throw them away out of fear that they were dangerous. And they were highly effective. Um, we were able to over time kind of sit in some of the areas we had put them in and watch people engage with them um, organically. And this, this treatment, because of the time that we were in 2004 was very necessary in a lot of ways. Um, here's a few more images of the various places we installed the work on a car. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna quickly say, you know, the, the, there are three kind of, these are kind of three areas that I, in my time working on public art projects, feel like are kind of key, key ideas to keep in mind um, in terms of your role in organizing that. One of them is the dichotomy or the relationship between agency and responsibility. Anytime you are invited to include work in public space, you, there's a, both a power and a responsibility associated with that. Um, thinking about trust and openness, both in the process of making work, but openness to the various things that could change and happen over time. Recognizing that when you make work in public space, you are always in a dialogue with different constituents in different spaces. And you have to be open to the different possibilities and outcomes and the different interpretations of the work that may emerge. And finally, that any kind of endeavor, any kind of public art endeavor is always a combination of lending knowledge and learning. Um, it's very rare that you will feel like you know everything about any given public space until you really spend a lot of time in that space and get to know the dynamics that exist there, both in the present moment and in the past. And so just always thinking about a process of developing and making public art as a combination of contributing your knowledge, but also being open to and recognizing that learning is part of that process. So I'm gonna stop there and um, uh, look at a few of the questions that are in the Q&A. So just give me a second while I unshare my screen. Okay, so Q&A. Um, let's see here. So I have a question. Um, um, do you consult with artists to build ideas into large scale public projects? Um, I, yes, I can. I haven't particularly done like a scaling up 
work in the way that you're asking. Um, however, with AIDA's project, all of us were very much a part of rescaling the project over and over as COVID unfolded and we realized what was and was not possible. Um, I have another question here. As project teams expand, how does your production budgeting and institutional support accommodate the necessary people power to build, facilitate, and maintain the work? That is a really great question. And I think that there's a two-part answer to that. One is planning for contingency. And I didn't, I wasn't explicit about this, but it's a really actually an important point in any public art project that you're working on, having contingency, which means a set of resources that is your backup that you're not relying on, but that you may need. And that could be people, that could be resources. The other thing that I would also think about is scale in relation to the needs of the project. So um, if you can't support the project team you need, then that means you can't support the project you need. And so those two things go hand in hand. And that might mean adjusting the timeline to figure out how to build those resources up, thinking creatively about it to get them from maybe new partners um, or new collaborators and understanding, um, I think really deeply that the value you place on your team is reflected in the value you place on the work. And I think I've been in a lot of conversations lately about urgency and about the myth of urgency. And so one of the things I always say is that there's always time to change things. And so I know that isn't a direct answer, but those are some of the things that I have learned over my time, like kind of working in these spaces. And I will say too, I've also been in projects where collaborators have been willing to get paid afterwards or compensated in some way afterwards. I've also been in on project teams where we engage in barter as a way to compensate each other. So I think you can also think creatively about how that might work as your team expands by necessity. Um, how do you fund public art practice? Are there design companies or resources that's a public pub that support public artists? Um, that is a very good question. Um, uh, I think that is a longer answer because it really depends on scale and it also depends on, in a lot of ways, the nature of your work. So for example, if you're an artist that's doing a lot of work around monuments right now, there's a lot of funding out there for you. If you're an artist that might work in a smaller city, there might be more funding for you out there. Um, the one thing, the one thing I would say about funding a public art practice is go, going back to some of the things I talked about in, um, in the presentation, which is when you're looking, seeking out funding for public art, you're not just seeking funding to make your work, you're seeking funding for engaging a certain set of publics in a certain way through the installation of public art or through the presentation of public art. So I think one of the things, and I think um, AIDA and the project team are really good at this, is thinking as broadly as possible about where our funding resources could be, tapping into the film community, tapping into the art community, but also tapping into the regional community where the project was kind of, um, uh, uh, came from, from the Balkan region. And so thinking about the different touch points your project have can open up new ways of thinking about funding. Um, and if you have more specific questions about what you're actually working on, um, you know, please, please feel free to send them over later. Um, let's see, another question I'm getting. Um, I'm curious to know if these projects had intentional components that address accessibility or how you've addressed this, particularly if the work itself is not physically accessible to those with disabilities. That is a great question. And the answer is yes, in some cases and not so much in others. So for Stotenema, that is a project that happens in a different public space every year. And because of where the project happened uh, last year um, on the grounds of the Memorial Center near the location of the burial site, um, AIDA got to work with an entire organization to think about accessibility to the space of the installation and um, think about all the things that they needed to make that possible. Um, so in that case, accessibility was kind of built into thinking about the specificity of the space. Uh, Kehinde Wiley's project, absolutely. We were thinking about accessibility, not just in terms of physical access. Wiley's project actually had a bench um, at the very bottom of it that people could sit on, but we were also thinking about access in terms of language. We had um, 
uh, interpretive text that was out on the plaza interpreted um, in about three different languages. Um, we also focus on image-based narrative for the um, interpretive materials that the um, ambassadors had so that um, they didn't need a lot of language to kind of move people through um, what they were trying to express. Um, and we also um, uh, were offering, if people wanted, um, other access um, resources for things like tours and stuff like that. But I will say with um, Times Square, they also have a pretty robust accessibility policy. So we were able to build from that a little and kind of address the specificities of the project um, for, Kahinde's, for Kahinde's work. Um, and I will admit that for Chicago ravioli project, we just put raviolis everywhere. And I cannot, cannot speak too much about accessibility, except that we put them in every place you could imagine. <laughs> um, I believe that's all the questions that I have um, in my queue. Uh, Chito, thank you so much. And you uh, are an artist yourself. And I think that that's and an educator. And I think that that is a valuable experience that adds to, um, to your understanding and sensibility in terms of public art. I have one question. We have one minute left. Um, about uh, engaging public, um, and especially with the Times Square project, but with all of them, because with public art, it's so important. But how do you, like, where do you even start? How do you go about it? Do you do market yeah. research? Do you just go um, in the street and ask people? Um, I think there are, it's a two way, it's a little bit of a, a, a dual process. I think one is it depends on, you know, the artists that you're working with and the project itself. They, those, those, that work usually has a set of ideas that embedded in it. And so trying to understand, you know, what are the various messages or ideas that this artist is trying to put into public space? And then I think the second part of it, and these are equally important things, is that research component. And depending on what kind of community you're in, that research can take a lot of different shapes. Um, you know, in Times Square, we had a lot of data because Times Square has a robust kind of surveillance uh, apparatus, but we actually conducted research for Times Square through the ambassador program because it was the first, one of the first times that Times Square had embarked on an engagement process like this. And so we had some idea, like we knew about languages and the kinds, you know, where people were coming from. We had a lot of data on that. But what we didn't have data on is how pe if people would want to engage and what were the things that we needed to put in place for that to happen. So um, part of the work was actually doing that research itself. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you.